introduction from uh, Frege, what Frege called his fundamental principle, um, which was that you should always sharply separate the psychological from the logical, the subjective from the objective. Um, now, I, I think that Frege was right, but I think that analytic philosophy of mind has ignored this advice. Um, and uh, my, my, my general project, which um, this talk today is a part, it's a part of a, of a short book that I'm writing, is what happens if we take this seriously. If we, if we really sharply separate the psychological from the object, as Fred, as Fred put it in the way that he meant. Um, this is my talk today. Um, in, in, in other work, and um, some of which I presented in Italy a number of times, I've argued that um, the failure to follow Frege's advice has led to an unsatisfactory conception of intentionality and its relationship to consciousness. Um, and so what I want to do today is not to defend that view as such. I'll say a few things in defense of it, but I want to offer some kind of genealogy of the reasons why we got into this situation. Um, so some recent historical speculation about uh, how how this situation has, has arisen. Um, and so if we want to understand in, the idea of intentionality as the mark of the mental, we shouldn't start with Fregean assumptions. Uh, but I want to try and explain, that's not what I'm going to argue for, but what I want to try and explain is how we got into that situation of um, thinking that that's where we should start from. Um, First of all, I say something about my view, which I call psychologism about the psychological, which I have um, talked about in Italy before and, and elsewhere. Um, and then I want to say something about what I call the propositional attitude project um, and how that relates to the problem of consciousness. Uh, and finally, I want to add my conjecture, which is that um, behaviorism played a, cru a crucial formative role in posing the problem of consciousness for us today. Um, I, I won't say what that role is now, I'll leave you in suspense. So psychologism about the psychological, this is my, um, what I call my view about intentionality and its relationship to consciousness. Um, and it's best illustrated by comparing what I want to say with what Frege wants to say. Frege famously said, I have used the word idea always in the psychological sense, and I have distinguished ideas from concepts and from objects. What is a content of my consciousness, my idea, should be sharply distinguished from what is an object of my thought. Now, I want to formulate the dis a distinction between the semantic and the intentional. The semantic is the field where of the discussion of the determination of truth value. A semantic theory is about how truth values of, of propositions are determined. Um, the intentional, on the other hand, broadly speaking, is the mind's direction upon its objects as Brentano called it. Intentional is a psychological feature uh, and the semantic is a linguistic feature or logical feature, how truth values are determined. Um, I, I think that, um, that it's, it's a common view that semantic and intentional in the analytic tradition, these words have been used interchangeably in many contexts. But I want to have a different view about how the semantic so defined relates to the intentional. Um, sorry about the background noise. It's beings, there are beings in the background. No. Here's semantics. This is what I, this is what I mean about semantics in this context. And I, I, the word of course can be used to mean many things and people can decide that it means other things. But um, I, uh, uh, I, I think it's important that it has in, um, in formal semantics. If someone has their microphone, they can, Olga, I think, has a microphone. Um, um, so here's a, here's a quote from Jeff. Can Speaks. anyone just switch the microphone off? Thank you. Um, here's Jeff Speaks from the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. If, if the Stanford Encyclopedia isn't mainstream what, about use, how to use terminology, then I don't know what is. Jeff Speaks says, most philosophers of language these days think that the meaning of an expression is a certain sort of entity and that the job of semantics is to pair expressions with the entities which are their meanings. For these philosophers, the central question about the right form of semantic theory concerns the nature of these entities. So anyone, anyone who's been educated in the semantic tradition um, will, will be familiar 
with that that basic idea. Um, and of course, uh, the idea in part derives from Frege, where you have a distinction between the reference of a term, one of the entities associated with, with words, another kind of entity associated with words, a sense of a term, and then Frege's other idea, which was the, uh, the idea, uh, Frege's other term, which was the idea or the word Vorstellung, as he used it. Now, Vorstellung has been dismissed as a, as a contribution to semantics by some of the main... Con um, the idea of the Vorstellung has been dismissed by, um, by some of the main commentators on, on Frege and others. And in, in, in the tradition of um, the philosophy of language of the 20th century, Dummett says this, that Frege accounts for tone. Tone he means the difference between the word horse and the word steed, for example, in English. As a matter of the association, a word or expression of certain ideas, by which he means mental images, Dummett says. Now, remarkably for a commentator on, on Frege, and Frege wrote very little about uh, ideas, um, it's, it doesn't take long to find out that isn't, this isn't actually what Frege meant. Frege didn't talk about just met ideas as just mental images. He said he talked about the inner world of sense impressions creations of the imagination, of sensations, of feelings and moods, a world of inclinations, wishes and decisions. I want to collect all these with the exception of decisions under the word idea. Dummett was wrong. These things aren't all mental images. So he uses the word idea in many different kinds of mental states other than um, the uh, just what Dummett calls mental images. Psychologism about the psychological then in my sense, if you aren't familiar with this great doctrine I'm trying to defend, is this that a theory of intentionality should be concerned with what Frege called ideas, not simply with sense and reference. That's the thesis in, in brief. If you get that picture, if you know Frege's distinction between sense, reference and ideas, then psychologism is the view that a theory of intentionality should start with ideas, that is to say, with what Frege called Vorstellung. This word is translated elsewhere as representation, in the translation of Kant into English, and as presentation in the translation of Brentano into English. So I think it's very natural to think what's going on when this Frege's talk of ideas was what other people meant by intentionality. Analytic philosophy of mind, though, I want to say, has rejected psychologism in my sense. Uh, analytic philosophy of mind has treated intentionality as explicable in wholly semantic terms. Remember what I meant by semantic. I'm, I mean semantic in terms of this, you know, the project of assigning entities to words. In terms of concepts like reference, sense, proposition, and truth, the theory of the proposition, roughly, roughly speaking. And I think for this reason, it's unable to deal with the relationship between intentionality and consciousness. I think for many analytic philosophers, they find the, the idea that consciousness should be explained in terms of intentionality utterly baffling because intentionality for them is understood in semantic terms and consciousness has got nothing to do with the proposition, basically. You've got the theory of the proposition on the one hand, then you've got consciousness on the other. And these seem such different things. Um, and I sympathize with that. Um, what we need to do is to understand how we got there. How do we get from the idea that intentionality for, for someone like Brentano um, was the mark of the mental? How do we get from that idea to the idea that intentionality has to be understood purely semantically, which makes it impossible to understand it as the mark of the mental? Um, so that's my, that's my task. Uh, in, in Brentano's book that Alberto mentioned, um, I guess there'll be a lot of discussion of Brentano in this meeting. Uh, he reintroduced the terminology of intentionality or intentional inexistence in terms of these phrases that direction upon an object or relation to a content. Um, Brentano's thesis, as I'm going to call it, is that all mental phenomena are intentional. There's also the thesis that only mental phenomena are intentional. I'm not going to talk about that. This is the all mental phenomena are intentional. In, in analytic philosophy, Brentano's um, thesis has an echo in the beginnings of analytic philosophy uh, with, the reje with the rejection of idealism that you find in Moore and Russell. Um, 
So it's not so much an echo of the Brentano thesis, but an echo of the concern with intentionality. Um, the, one of the essential parts of the reject, rejection of idealism, as I understand it, was a, an, a concern with objective and absolute truth. So one of the things that they were rejecting, Warren Russell, was the idea that truth was um, a matter of degree, something that the, that the idealists they were concerned with, the, the British Hegelians, um, thought that, um, there were, that, that there was no such thing as gaining absolute truth and judgment until you reached, until you passed through this process of achieving access to the absolute somewhere. Um, Russell and Moore rejected that and said that propositions could be simply and absolutely true. And when you judge, judge something, it, that, that judgment could be simply true. And it could be true about some subject matter external to your judgment. Um, so there was this concern with the notion of judgment and therefore with what is judged. Um, broadly speaking, this is concerned with intentionality. The theory of judgment is, a, is part of the theory of intentionality because what judgment is, is making a claim about how things are in reality. So moving beyond oneself, transcending oneself and pointing one's mind at, at the world in a certain way. But the judgment in, in question, the way they thought about the idea of judgment was in terms of the proposition. The proposition was the crucial component in the theory of judgment. Um, and as anyone who's familiar with that first decade or so of the 20th century in analytic philosophy will know, they went back and forward on the question of falsehood, whether there could be false propositions. And Russell for a while gave up the idea that there were, that there were um, um, that the objects of judgment were propositions at all, and so on, and so on. And there was a, um, but what I, my point about this is that to, interest in judgment and absolute truth is also an interest in intentionality. Um, it's formulated in terms of the proposition rather than in the way that Brentano um, formulated the concern with intentionality. Now, this gave rise to what I want to call, I think I took this phrase from Dennett, um, the propositional attitude project. Um, I think the the it's fair to say that the theory of intentionality in 20th century analytic philosophy was the theory of the propositional attitudes. How did this happen? Um, now it wasn't really just because Brentano himself thought that, that, that intentionality was about propositional attitudes. Um, even though Chisholm, when he, he was um, someone who had a strong interest in Brentano and spent a lot of time in Austria, translated Brentano. He was translated Brentano's criterion of the mental into an analytic idiom. Now, I'm, I don't have time to say what that is. So if you don't know what it is, it's not very important. Uh, if you do know what it is, you know what I'm talking about anyway. It's really a linguistic criterion of intentionality. Uh, in effect, what we now would call intentionality with an S and that whole confusing mess has left its mark on the subsequent discussion. Um, I think in those days, you know, it was important that if you wanted to say that if you wanted to introduce some piece of terminology, you had to give necessary and or sufficient conditions for the use of that word. And that's what Chisholm was doing with the, with um, his, his invention of the criteria of intentionality. Um, but this was taken up by very influential philosophers, even more influential than Chisholm. Uh, for example, Quine, one of the most influential philosophers of the late 20th century. Um, and in a famous passage in Word and Object, Quine says that the scholastic word intentional was revived by Brentano in connection with the verbs of propositional attitude and related verbs, hunt, want, and so on. There remains a thesis of Brentano's illuminatingly developed of late by Chisholm that there is no breaking out of the intentional vocabulary by explaining its members in other terms. Um, so, so says Quine. Um, for such an influential passage, it's actually, it's remarkably full of errors. I'm going to pick out two. Um, one is that it's true that, well, he's right, the scholastic word, intentional was a scholastic word, uh, and it was revived by Brentano, it was revived by Brentano, but not in connection with the verbs of propositional attitudes, because as most people in this group, I think, will know, Brentano didn't have the concept of a propositional attitude. For him, belief was not an attitude to a proposition. Um, as for related verbs, hunt and want, Brentano, as I, uh, as, as I know, 
the Brentano work, and there are experts here in, in this talk who will know more. Hunting was not one of Brentano's examples. It was one of Quine's examples and quantifies and propositional attitudes. So maybe he's misremembering things by thinking that Brentano wrote it, whereas in fact, he was writing about hunting. His paper, Quantifies and Propositional Attitudes from 57 or whenever it was, begins with the example of hunting. Brentano wasn't interested in hunting. Um, hunting wasn't a mental phenomenon. Um, there remains a thesis of Brentano developed by Chisholm that there's no breaking out of the intentional vocabulary by explaining its members in other terms. This isn't a thesis of Brentano's. This is a thesis of Chisholm's. It was also a thesis of Geach's in, um, in the 1950s. Brentano wasn't interested in explain, trying to explain vocabulary by explaining members in other terms. He, he was interested in the distinction between phenomena, not in how to explain a vocabulary. Um, so Quine's, um, uh, the extent of Quine's um, mistakes here about what the, what the tradition actually says uh, is only balanced by the strength of his influence on the subject. As we can see just another example here. What Brent Davidson says that the distinguishing feature of the mental is that he exhibits what Brentano called intentionality. You may call those verbs mental that express propositional attitudes like believing, blah, blah, blah. But um, that wasn't what Brentano called intentionality. There wasn't a distinction among verbs anyway, a distinction among phenomena. Um, the notion of a propositional attitude uh, as many of you will know, it comes from Russell. Russell formulated the phrase in analysis of mind, but he, it, it came up much earlier in his work when he talked about mind, when he was talking about mind on it, actually, when he said belief is a certain attitude towards proposition, which is knowledge when they are true, error when they are false. So I think, you know, it was much easier to publish in mind in those days if you could just say belief, belief, knowledge is just true belief. You could say that. Um, and, uh, but, you know, Russell obviously didn't, there wasn't much peer review in those days and Russell didn't rewrite anything. Um, the, the thing I'm interested in is this phrase that belief is an attitude to a proposition. That, that idea was a distinctive contribution of, the, of Russell and the Russellian tradition, attributed back to Brentano by Quine and Davidson and, and others, um, without actually paying attention to what Brentano's view actually was, I, I believe. Of course, not just beliefs of propositional attitudes, we know this. In any state of mind that's attributed in this S, the subject, and then the verb, and then the mental verb, and then you have a, a that clause, anything attributed in that, in that style. These are, just, these are the propositional attitude verbs. Uh, and this was the product, this was the province of intentionality, the study of intentionality, it was the study of the propositional attitudes. Uh, and so on. Um, canonical statement of this view, that propositional attitudes there were thought of as relations to propositions. Bodle says belief looks like a two-place relation. Our theory of belief should permit us to save the appearances, Bodle says. Um, I think anyone familiar with the 70s and 80s and 90s literature on, on intentionality will see that intentionality is a propositional um, attitude. It was the standard view. There are two aspects to this the propositional attitude project, at least two aspects. One was that we investigate the propositional attitudes by investigating the nature of their relata. So we can ask ourselves, what are, what are the propositions? Are propositions world, made of worldly objects and properties in the Russell style, or made up of senses in the Frege style, or made up of Lewis Stolnacker sets of possible worlds, and so on, this kind. Something. So it's a familiar kind of project. Notice this project is all within the domain of what I'm calling semantics. Um, so you have a happy marriage between the theory of intentionality uh, and the theory of, um, of the determination of truth value or semantic. Um, all, all these um, views, you know, the, the, Russell Stolner, the, the Russell view, the Frege view, the St Lewis Stolnik view, we're all about the determination of truth value. Um, and you can't have determination of truth value unless you've got the sort of thing that can have a truth value. And that sort of thing is the proposition. So the theory of prop the proposition was crucial to this way of understanding of intentionality. Um, 
the second part of the, uh, of the propositional attitude project is to how to explain it was how to explain propositional attitudes within a materialistic framework. Um, and here, there's a famous quote by from Field where Field said that materialist has to give a materialistically adequate account of the relation between a purpose a person and a proposition. Now it's less it's less common to hear things like that said these days. I mean, um, but uh, it's in the background to the whole story about the language of thought that then became a debate, um, which again has somewhat died down now. Um, but that that thing, giving an account of the relation between a person and a proposition, was, became known as a, what what it what was meant by giving a theory of content. Okay. So here are the four principles behind the propositional attitude project, as I'm thinking of it. Intentional states are all propositional attitudes. Propositional attitudes are relations to propositions. The central task for the theory of intentionality is to identify the right kind of propositions. And the next task then is to give a theory or reductive theory of content. That's the propositional attitude project. Um, okay, now one obvious difficulty is that there seem to be many mental states, intentional states which are not propositional attitudes, love, hate, imagining, desiring, thinking about something and so on. Um, and I've talked about this in, in some other work and there are people here today. I'm pleased to see that Alex Krasnikowski is here who has written important work on this and has edited a volume on non-proposition intentionality with Michel Montague. Um, it's an important uh, collection and contribution. Um, but here I want to discuss something else. I want to discuss the relationship between the propositional attitude project and the problem of consciousness or explaining consciousness, understanding consciousness. Um, I think that thinking about intentionality in terms of the propositional attitude can make Brentano's, Brentano's thesis mysterious. How could consciousness, being conscious of something, be a relation to a proposition? So how can consciousness be explained in terms of relations to propositions? How can that, um, how can int intentionality be the mark of the mental if consciousness is part of mentality? Um, and a nice ex sort of expression of, of this bafflement or skepticism in uh, a paper of David Papineau's, he explores this in his recent uh, forthcoming book actually on perception. Uh, David says, propositions are abstract entities seems something quite amiss with the suggestion that my here and now conscious feelings are constituted by my bearing any kind of relation to abstract entities. Um, and it's hard not to sympathize with that. Um, actually, the question of whether they're abstract or not, or re relations to abstract entities, isn't quite the central, the central problem, it seems to me, because um, if you have scruples about propositions, that's not quite the issue. And I think Papineau actually agrees with this. Um, there are some philosophers recently um, who think that propositions, talk about propositions can really be explained or reduced to types, talk about types of mental states or act, uh, types of judgment. I'm thinking here about Hanks's book, Propositional Content, recent work by Scott Soames, for example, um, fairly recent, five years ago counts as recent. Um, and there, Papineau's question can be raised about this too. How can consciousness be understood in terms of the type of mental, of the type of judgment. Um, so I think the relationship to propositions is one issue. I think the idea of, of a propositional attitude being the core explanatory um, element is another. Um, let me just briefly sketch um, how two theoretical approaches to consciousness would find, would have difficulties with this way of thinking. Um, or rather, sorry, two, two theoretical consciousness, approaches to consciousness would, would um, attempt to deal with this difficulty, I mean. Um, there's a standard intentionalism or representational, representationalism, where you think in terms of the, um, distinct types of content and or attitude you understand consciousness in terms of distinct type of content and or attitude. Um, or the other approach to consciousness is to distinguish the proposition attitudes from qualia. And you say, well, proposition attitudes are one thing, but consciousness is something else. It's the instantiation of non-intentional elements or qualia. Um, and just very briefly then, the problem with standard representationalism in this context is that the phenomenal character 
conscious experience, the idea that the phenomenal character of conscious experience is identical with its representational content, faces the obstacle that apparently conscious and unconscious states can have the same content. And Chalmers made this point some years ago, um, and representationism has problems dealing with this. When it comes to qualia or non-intentional um, properties, um, the intrinsic ineffable non-intentional properties, I'll say a bit more about that in a minute, um, it's, a, it's a basically a sensory paradigm of consciousness. So it has difficulty understanding what it would be to have a conscious thought. Conscious thought need not involve ineffable sensory qualities. It could just involve what has come to be called cognitive phenomenology, whatever that exactly is, but the experience of coming to understand something, which can be an episode, a manifestation of a difference in consciousness. Um, so both of those views have difficulties uh, understanding consciousness and propositional content, and therefore intentionality on the propositional attitude view doesn't seem like the right category of things to constitute consciousness. Um, on both of those views, propositional content doesn't come out as the right category of thing to constitute consciousness. So it's not really surprising that philosophers like Papineau are skeptical of attempts to link content in this sense and consciousness. Um, I sympathize with them. What we need is another way of understanding the relationship between consciousness and intentionality. So what I've, what I've tried to say so far is that um, if we understand intentionality in terms of the proposition, and so if our theory of, con our theory of intentionality is the proposition attitude project, um, then uh, it'll be very hard, it's very hard to see how intentionality and consciousness can be, can be particularly connected. Um, so how do we, and that, and I sympathize with that. But since I want to say um, that I've started, I've started with the attitude of understanding intentionality in terms of what Frege called the idea, that is to say, mental representation. And I want to say the list of those things that Frege calls ideas, they are paradigms of consciousness. Sensations, episode in the imaginations, um, um, the, 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 the conscious, the experience, the conscious experience involved in perception, all these things are ideas for Frege. Um, those things are paradigms of intentionality. So if we start with the idea that we understand intentionality in terms of the ideas, then uh, it's very natural to think that this could be part of understanding consciousness. That is to say, the here and now subjectivity of the mental. Um, what I want, to, if you're skeptical about this, what I want to now do is to try and suggest a reason why how we got into this situation. How did it become so difficult for philosophers to link consciousness and intentionality. And this is going to be my last um, point in the last um, 10 to 15 minutes or so. Why would it become so difficult for philosophers to link these things? Why did it become such a, on the one hand, such a mystery for some philosophers and so baffling for some of them to see it and so obvious for others? Um, I think one half of the answer is the propositional attitude conception of intentionality. I feel like that's, that's part of what I want to say. Um, if you restrict yourself to, the, to a conception of intentionality in terms of the propositions, the proposition and the determination of truth value, then inevitably consciousness is going to become mysterious within that framework. Um, but the other half of the answer is a conception of consciousness that I think derives from behaviorism. Um, now by behaviorism here, I mean, um, uh, behaviorism in psychology. Um, um, sometimes it's distinguished, it's normal to distinguish, and the textbooks will make this, these distinctions between um, philosophical behaviorism and psychological behaviorism. Um, I, I think the relevant form of behaviorism, the interesting form of behaviorism, is the psychological form. Um, the philosophical form of behaviorism, which is to say something like, you know, mental states had simply dispositions to behave. There is no occurrent in a life or something like this. Um, I think that's an uninteresting view. I don't think anyone ever held it. Um, I, don't, I don't think Ryle held it, for example. I don't think Wittgenstein held it. All the people are sometimes cited as behaviors. So I don't think there really was a philosophical behaviorism. 
it's, some, it's one of those things that's made up um, uh, in order to knock it down. But of course, there was psycho there was behaviorism in psychology, and this was a very important doctrine. Um, essence of it brilliantly expressed here by uh, Tolman in a famous paper. He said, everything important in psychology can be investigated in essence through the continued experimental and theoretical analysis of the determiners of rat behavior at a choice point in a maze. Everything important in psychology, everything, everything important in psychology can be investigated in essence by looking at rat behavior at a choice point in a maze. Now there's a view, there's a view. I don't think many people hold that view today, but um, it's quite, that's quite a statement. Um, interestingly enough, Tolman was the person who invented the term raw feels, where the raw feel was supposed to be a term for that bit of conscious experience that psychology can't study because it's private and subjective and therefore not capable of scientific treatment, as he said. If there be raw fields cor correspondent with such with dis discriminate and expectations, these raw fields are very, by very definition private and not capable of scientific treatment. And we may leave the question as to whether they exist and what to do about them if they do exist to other disciplines in psychology, for example, to logic, epistemology and metaphysics. Whatever the answers of these other disciplines, we as mere psychologists need not be concerned. Um, I'd just like to comment in passing how strange it is for him to think that logic should deal with the theory of raw fields. Um, but I suppose there are there are the kind of um, systems of qualia like Nelson Goodman and this kind of thing. I don't know quite how that fits into the whole thing. But anyway, what he's saying here, what Tolman is saying here, is that uh, there may well be raw fields. Uh, and if there are, they are um, they shouldn't be dealt with by psych psychology because they're the ineffable private um, parts of the of the mental that aren't capable of scientific treatment. So this is a very very important part of the whole behaviorist project. Of course, was that all the evidence for any psychological claim should be objectively and scientifically measurable. Um, so. Um, that was that was the main. There was this, uh, as anyone who knows about the history of psychology will, will, will recognize this fact. That psychology has always been concerned with the scientific status and what the basis of it is. The basis of science, uh, of psychology as a science, is, um, and this was why raw fields don't come into it. It's not because there aren't any raw fields. It's just they can't be studied by science because they're private. They can't. Now, the influence of behaviorism, I think, um, was to create a conception of the mental which, which did not essentially involve consciousness. I think that's the essential legacy of, of, um, of behaviorism. Consciousness was conceived of in terms of raw fields, and the conception, you had a conception of the mental which thought of consciousness as kind of incidental here and not capable of scientific study. So you had this conception of what we can study in the mental, um, but it didn't involve consciousness. So when consciousness re-entered psychology and philosophy, and this is my conjecture, it was still conceived of as essentially independent of other functions of the mind. Um, so I think this was the legacy of behaviorism, even though people rejected behaviorism, when people started studying then went on to study, study consciousness, they were thinking of it as something which then had to be added on to the conception of the mental that we basically got from behaviorism. And hence qualia. Now, that's my conjecture about where ineffable qualia come from. Ineffable qualia don't, don't come from introspection. They come from filling the gap which was left by the reintroduction of consciousness into the science of the mind after, but, but preserving the conception of the mental which they got from behaviorism. That's my hypothesis. It's a big, it's a big hypothesis, and there are probably lots of exceptions to it. But it, I'm trying to tell a story that makes sense why we got where we are today. And here's, here's a little bit more evidence. Now, it's even among the most mentalistic philosophers, like Jerry Vodor, he has a distinction between consciousness and the rest of the mind, which um, 
uh, which I think owes a lot to that picture that we get from Lucy Tom. Um, here's what Fodor says. It used to be universally taken for granted that problems about consciousness and problems of intentionality are intrinsically linked. Freud changed all that, he says. Um, there's another whole big story there about what Freud, why, whether Freud had anything to do with this at all, but let's ignore that. Um, he made it seem plausible that explaining behavior might require the postulating of, of intentional but unconscious states. Um, in fact, what was going on, I think, was that behaviorism um, proposed that explaining behavior or um, anything that was relevant to psychology did not require any, any appeal to consciousness. That was the point. Over the last century, especially in Chomsky and linguistics and in cognitive psychology, Fodor said, Freud's idea appears to have been amply vindicated. Dividing and conquering, concentrating on intentionality and ignoring consciousness has proved a remarkably successful research strategy so far. And that conception where you, where you think of intentionality as something which essentially has, doesn't have anything to do with consciousness, so consciousness has to be something additional which you study in a different way, is the thing that I'm saying is the legacy of behaviorism. You find it too in Ned Block, uh, more explicitly, I think, even so. When Ned Block talked about what he called the greatest chasm in the philosophy of mind, maybe in all of philosophy, dividing two perspectives on consciousness. Two perspectives differ on whether there is anything in the phenomenal character of conscious experience that goes beyond the intentional, the cognitive, and the functional. A convenient terminological handle on the dispute is whether there are qualia, or qualitative properties of conscious experience. Those who think that the phenomenal character of conscious experience goes beyond the intentional, the cognitive, and the functional believe in qualia. Now there it's very explicit that what, it, what qualia is and what Bloch came to call phenomenal consciousness, or it's changed his views in many ways, but initially phenomenal consciousness was introduced in terms of this idea of qualia. Qualia was defined as something that goes beyond the intentional, the cognitive, and the functional. Those who think the phenomenal character of conscious experience goes beyond the intentional, the cognitive, the functional, believe in qualia. So says, so says Ned Block. Yeah. There, so there it's absolutely clear. You've got the intentional linked together with the cognitive and the functional. Those are the things that you could study without studying consciousness, um, except consciousness in the access sense, which, uh, which isn't the, the interesting sense for Block. And then there's qualia, which is the bit that's added on. So I, my claim is that that picture derives from uh, that picture of what I call um, the phenomenal consciousness as the phenomenal residue, the residue of what's left over, the raw feel, what's left over after everything else. That picture comes from behaviorism. Um, I say that not to call people names or to tar them with associations with um, discredited theories, but to actually explain how we got to where we got today in analytic philosophy. One part of that explanation is the Propositional Attitude Project. The other part of the explanation is um, the legacy of behaviorism. You put those two things together, and you can see why it's so hard then for, for analytic philosophers to understand consciousness in terms of intentionality. Um, so, you might say, so what? I'm not a behaviorist, I don't care about behaviorism. But nonetheless, my point is that even non-behaviorists may gain their conception of consciousness from their behaviorist predecessors. I want to say this is one of the origins of notions like raw fields, qualia, ineffable phenomenal properties. These are ideas that emerge out of um, you know, this idea that there was this thing that psychology couldn't, scientific psychology couldn't deal with. Um, that was the thing. It was there, but they couldn't deal with it. Someone else could deal with it, but psychology can't deal with it. Um, and then, the, then my, my claim is that that conception of the rest of the mental was preserved even when people started um, rediscovering consciousness as subject of scientific study. Um, I also think this is where the puzzles about zombies and so on come from, and that the, the way if you want to understand what a zombie is, and David Chalmers' a sense in his original book, um, you have to have something like the phenomenal residue conception of consciousness um, in order to 
and make sense of the idea of a zombie. Um, but that's another story, and I'm not going to tell that, that story today about, about what zombies mean. It's going to be in another part of my book. So my conclusions then are, um, first, that analytic theories of intentionality have been anti-psychologistic in my sense. Um, that the heart of the analytic philosophy of intentionality has been the propositional attitude project. And the third conclusion is that the propositional attitude project makes it difficult to link consciousness with intentionality in any satisfactory way. And the fourth is that this difficulty becomes impossible if you adopt the conception of consciousness which derives from behaviorism. And um, that's my take home message. Um, Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now it's time for David Zottoli to comment on uh, uh, Tim's paper. David, you have about uh, 15 minutes for your comments. Yeah, okay. Are you there? Yep. Yeah. Do you hear me? Yes, I can see you now. Now, great. Okay. 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 Uh, well, thank you. Thank you, Tim, for your talk. It was very interesting, very intriguing. And I, I'm sure and I'm not the only one who would like uh, to know something more about uh, uh, zombies and behaviorism, but uh, my, my comments will focus on, uh, on the former part. And so, well, uh, I am very much sympathetic with the non-propositional conception of uh, intentionality. But I was wondering whether by rejecting the propositional, uh, the propositional attitude project, it really becomes uh, easier to connect uh, consciousness and uh, intentionality. For, uh, um, well, it seems that uh, on the one hand, uh, even if uh, we conceive uh, uh, intentional content as non-propositional, uh, conscious and unconscious states may still have the same the same content. So uh, maybe a, a non-propositional perspective on intentionality cannot justify alone the view that consciousness is constituted by intentionality. And on the other hand, um, I was, uh, I guess that uh, maybe what's uh, what's uh, required on top of a non-propositional conception of intentionality is indeed uh, psychologism. But uh, uh, I don't see how the non-propositional view could help securing the truth of psychologism, because uh, there may be reasons to embrace uh, anti-psychologism, which are independent of the propositional view, so that uh, uh, just like uh, Frege held that uh, psychologism about logics and mathematics was wrong because facts about logics and mathematics uh, are true or false independently of whether anyone actually judges them to be true or false. It may be argued that psychologism about intentionality, uh, even if intentionality is non-propositional, is wrong because there are facts about intentionality which are similarly objective. And um, because there is at least some intentional relations uh, may hold independently of uh, their being instantiated by, by mental states. And well, it seems indeed that uh, uh, even uh, the two, two fundamental features of non-propositional intentionality, namely aspectual shape and the possible non-existence uh, of the intentional object can be exemplified by non-mental representations just as well as by mental representation. So uh, even though clearly non-mental representations uh, have derived intentionality, since they acquire their intentional properties in virtue of our ascriptions, uh, once uh, those ascriptions are made, it seems that uh, uh, non-mental representations uh, can have their intentional properties uh, independently of whether minded subjects uh, are actually present interpreting them. So it seems to me that uh, even if uh, 
the relationship between uh, non-propositional uh, conception uh, of um, of intentionality and the truth uh, of psychologism. I was wondering whether uh, uh, the assumption of a psychologistic perspective can actually fulfill the role of connecting uh, uh, consciousness and intentionality in a satisfactory way. Uh, because it seems to me that uh, once we assume that uh, intentionality necessarily involves some kind of, let's say, subjective presentation, uh, there are two options. So uh, either uh, one takes uh, uh, one takes the kind of presentationality to be coextensive co with consciousness or or not, and uh, both cases uh, seems to me somehow problematic in because in the first case uh, uh, the nature of the connection between consciousness consciousness and intentionality would be clear obviously, but uh, of course the intentionality of unconscious mental states. Uh, would be left uh, unexplained. And in a second case, uh, uh, if it could be possible to introduce uh, somehow the notion of uh, unconscious presentation, um, so making justice to the intuition that there are unconscious intentional states, uh, I was wondering whether it would be possible then to account for the difference between conscious and unconscious presentation. So in, this, in these options, it, it seemed it seems like uh, we are uh, back again where we started. So uh, with uh, a notion of intentionality, we, we, which cannot draw the line between uh, conscious and unconscious mental states. Um, that's that's uh, that's it. Let's say. Okay. Thanks a lot, uh, Davide. Uh, before starting the general discussion, if you want to say something in response. Um, thank you, Davide. Thank you very much. That's uh, that's um, really great comments. Thank you. Um, um, uh, let me just say two things quickly. I mean, you, in your first set of comments, you focused on the um, uh, contrast between the propositional and the non-propositional, uh, and I totally agree with you there. And I think um, maybe in my presentation, I didn't make this clear enough that. Um, so the idea isn't that we will save intentionality as a mark of the mental by turning to the non-propositional form of intentionality. Um, because of course, non-propositional forms of intentionality can also be studied as part of a semantic project. So, um, so if, for example, you know, you take the research on um, uh, intentional transitives, the work of people like Graham Forbes or you know, Mark Sainsbury's recent book on intentional transitive verbs. Uh, this is a semantic um, project that they're trying to understand. They're trying to understand, you know, what it means to say that, um, you know, Alex is thinking about a unicorn or something, um, and what the truth conditions of that are, what that attributions are. Um, and so there's a semantic project for understanding non-propositional intentionality too. Uh, which has only come to the fore fairly recently um, because of the dominance of the propositional attitude model. So my first point would, in response to you would be, yes, I, you're absolutely right that propos non-propositional intentionality isn't supposed to save us here. What saves us is psychologism, uh, which is not to understand it in some, not to begin with semantics um, in understanding intentionality. Um, uh, then I suppose your second point is, well, how does psychologism really help? Um, oh, and you made the point about the, un the unconscious, so let me say something about that. Um, so it's no part of my psychologism that there is no un unconscious intentionality. So we have to make sense of unconscious intentionality. Um, and my view about that, which is independent of today's talk, is that um, we have to think of unconscious intentionality as something very different from conscious intentionality. Um, it's something which is in a certain way, the, the unconscious mind is much more, um, is much less determinate than the conscious mind. That's what, I, that's my, that's a short brief way of saying it, that um, the contents of your conscious mind are 
are much more determinate, vivid, and apparent than the conscious than the contents of your unconscious. Um, yeah, you know, Quine talked about the web of belief, and I think belief is unconscious. I think it's more like the swamp of belief. You know, that you dig down into the swamp, and everything's all tangled up together in all this mud at the bottom, and, and you know, and you make things you make things determinate by bringing them to consciousness. So I think unconscious intentionality and conscious intentionality are very, very different um, things. Now that doesn't answer the question of what consciousness is. What I'm trying to do is to make room for conscious intentionality. That's my, I, want, I, want, I don't want to make it unintelligible as it seems to be within the proposition attitude framework. Um, but obviously I've got a lot more to do to say um, what that room is, but my starting point is basically this. Start with the subject, the subject's point of view, and states of mind, the, the conscious states of mind that Frege talks about when he talks about representations or ideas. Uh, don't start with semantic objects being assigned to um, sentences. No, that's, that's... That, that sounds good. <laughs> Thanks. You point, pointed out the way ways in which I should have said it. It's psychologism is the point, not non-propositionism. Thanks. <laughs>